This is Transmission Interrupted, the podcast series from NEETEC, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Welcome to Transmission Interrupted from NEETEC. Hello, and welcome to Transmission Interrupted. My name is Jill Morgan. I'm a nurse at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, and a subject matter expert with NEETEC. For those of you not yet familiar with NEETEC, our mission is to set the standard for special pathogen preparedness and response across the U.S. healthcare system with the goal of driving best practices, closing knowledge gaps, and developing innovative resources. NEETEC works alongside and in cooperation with the CDC and is funded by ASPR, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. On today's episode, I'm so grateful to be able to welcome back a friend of mine, Jerry Nevin. Jerry is currently the Assistant Administrator of the Rose Blumpkin Jewish Home, a 105-bed skilled nursing facility in Nebraska. He's been a nurse for more than 20 years and has been a state surveyor with the state of Nebraska for long-term care facilities. Jerry, I'm so glad to have you. I think this is such an important topic. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you for having me, Jill. And yes, I agree. This is a very important topic. So we're going to talk about long-term care, and I'd like to just start out by making sure everybody is clear on what we mean by that term. So Jerry, can you tell us what sort of falls under the long-term care umbrella? So long-term care umbrella, depending on who you're talking to, whether it's CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or a state agency, it really boils down to LTC or long-term care are those facilities that are skilled nursing or rehab facilities that is subacute, not acute. Acute would be more hospital-based or just nursing facilities, which is they've finished their skilled days and they're not safe to go home. And so they need to stay in a nursing facility. So a skilled nursing facility and a nursing facility, the difference is skilled offers a rehab and nursing facility is strictly the long-term care piece of it. It's their new home. Great. Thank you. So I know that COVID hit these long-term care facilities really hard, both hard on the staff and on the residents. What is it like out there right now? Has anybody been able to sort of get back to a business as usual status? Where are we? And walk us through what that landscape has looked like. Okay. So Originally, when COVID first started and everybody realized the dangers, especially to our older population, CMS mandated in March of 20 that everybody close their doors. No visitors, no vendors. It needed to be strictly people that needed to be there. And the problem with that was some families needed to be there for their loved ones or loved ones needed them to be there. And we kind of broke that. So we started using different technologies, different ideas to try and get the residents reconnected with their families in a meaningful way. Window visits was one way. The problem is if you had a resident that was hard of hearing or you had a resident that had visual acuity issues, now all of a sudden they can't see and they're not able to touch. Touch is a huge piece that we sometimes forget, but because we knew so little about the virus and how it replicated and how it spread and everything else, it was CMS's way of trying to safeguard everybody. You know, masking, we know that that works for flu. It also worked for COVID to begin with, till we realized that it's really more of an airborne as opposed to a particulate issue. So now we have to try and figure out the masking and the OSHA regulations and the rest of that. And then, of course, now you have residents, especially residents that don't have all of their mental faculties. They have some dementia. They have some other memory type issues. And now all of a sudden you have staff coming in wearing gowns, gloves, face shields, masks. It would be like approaching a child in a surgical suite without prepping them as to what is going on because the child isn't going to know they're going to get scared. Our old folks did the exact same thing. And that really wow. hurt. It hurt them psychosocially until they got used to the idea and understood what was going on. And 
But even some people that have really advanced dementia still don't quite understand or they think their families have abandoned them, which is really hard. So the window, the window visits was a good thing. It was a step in the right direction. Using technology like iPads and iPhones and Android devices and trying to use the video technology that we have out there to communicate, that was a good thing, but not everybody gets it. And what's worse is sometimes these old folks, you know, people that are over the age of 85, this technology scares them. They don't understand it. I, and, it scares me sometimes, and I'm under the age of 85, so I certainly get that. Yeah, I can't imagine how hard it would be in the midst of this to try to get good uptake of new technology between family members who might not be proficient themselves and putting that in place in a nursing facility. Well, and the other part of it is the cost. CMS said, well, you know what, we're going to make available CMP money, which is civil money penalties. So when a facility gets fined by CMS, that fine doesn't go to CMS, it goes into that pot. And states have control of that pot. And CMS said, well, you can spend up to $3,500 to attempt and get good tech, but then you had to have the infrastructure for it. You know, you had to have a stable Wi-Fi or you had to have a stable network and I've been in places as a surveyor that don't. And so right. I don't know what those folks did. Yeah. A lot of rural communities really suffer from a lack of fast internet. And certainly for the kinds of technologies you're talking about, to really make a meaningful back and forth visit with loved ones, you know, you would rely on good internet or connectivity kind of things. And, and I suppose that's also putting an extra burden on these facility staff to be tech support for their residents. Yes. And in fact, it's kind of funny. A lot of my nurses would call me because I'd be the one setting it all up. But if I'm not there trying to walk them through it over the phone or having the IT folks try and walk it through them over the phone is not the easiest thing because yeah. not everybody is tech savvy. Sure. So I hear an awful lot of frustration, right? So, so I love the phrase you use, you know, we sort of, we broke this relationship. We, mm -hmm. we were forced to keep people away from their loved ones for their own protection. We get that, but still a very difficult situation. And being unable to visit or see loved ones in person must have been so hard on residents and family members. But that also, as we said, sort of puts an additional burden on long-term care staff members. I mean, I've always worked in an acute care side of medicine and patients come and go. But in these facilities, you're talking about a person's residence and the folks that work at these facilities have really developed bonds and relationships. So tell me a little bit about the effect these visitation changes had on both your residents and on your staff members. On the resident side of it, like I stated before, there are some residents because of their dementia or their memory issues or their cognitive issues, I think would really be the best way of putting it. They struggled. They thought families abandoned them. They thought families put them there and then forgot about them. Even though family members would call every day. And when we were finally able to get some of the technology and get it set up, now you not only have to work with the staff, but you have to work with the families on the other side and make sure that they are able to understand how to do it and, and those types of things so that they could communicate and to set those things up. Zoom is really a, a great tool that we started using more than FaceTime because that was a tool that multiple people could jump in on before FaceTime allowed to, you know, their multiple folks. Plus, not everybody has, say, an Apple. And because of our technology rules, we only allowed iOS devices, Apple devices, because Android apps had issues of hacking and not allowing my network to stay secure. So my IT folks said no. So we had some of those issues that we had to get over. That's why Zoom was such a nice product to be able to utilize and have other people part of it. It allowed families to be able to partake in holidays with their families, even though they were 
on another area of town or another part of the country yeah, and be able to share those types of things. As far as the staff, the staff, yes, grew very much attached, even more so with the residents and having consistent staff is always a good thing. The problems that we kind of ran into with staff was, you know, staff would get sick. They would be with their families or they'd be out of the building doing their things. And even if they tried to protect themselves, they would still catch COVID. And then they're gone for two weeks. And then all of a sudden, it's just like the family's being gone. Wait a minute, where's the staff member? And are they okay? And, you know, we can't tell them that they were sick with COVID and those types of things. So testing has been a huge thing for us. We spend a lot of money every month to offer testing to visitors so that they know that when they come to visit their loved one or come visit their friend that currently that it's something they can do and we're supposed to ask if they're vaccinated and we do but they don't have to test to come in and they don't have to be vaccinated to come in and if they say well yeah i'm vaccinated i can't turn around and say well i need to see your covid card you know so i mean we've kind of opened some things up that way And it's been in stages, but now the complaint that I get from families is, this is the only place I have to wear a mask. This is the only place where you're still restricting my movement. I can't go to other wings if I know other people. We have four neighborhoods in my facility and we don't mix the neighborhoods. If we do a large group activity, they're socially distanced and separated and all the residents are masked. And the reason we do that, and we tell families this all the time, sometimes it sinks in and sometimes it doesn't, but we tell them it's because we don't want to have to quarantine the whole building if somebody's sick or somebody becomes exposed. I can minimize that isolation, for lack of a better phrase, that that separation. And that's quite a balancing act, I'm sure, trying to keep residents safe, keep your staff safe, prevent another infection, whether it's COVID coming back through or whether it's influenza, you're balancing the responsibilities you have for the facility. You're balancing the rights and what we know is best for these residents and their family members, along with a lot of pretty stringent rules from organizations like CMS. That's been quite a journey from the beginning of COVID when we didn't really understand much going through all of these sort of iterative changes, making some improvements. And now, how are you able to follow your community spread? How are you able to think about influenza or going into the fall and having another season of something? I wonder, kind of, Jerry, looking back, which parts of those changes that you put in place for COVID will carry you forward and which things you say, God, we got to come up with something different there. Well, I've explained to families, you know, vaccination is a huge piece. I have some people still out there, some family members that think COVID is non-existent. It's somebody's myth, even though people have died. We have been very, very fortunate that we've had no loss of staff due to COVID. We haven't had anybody die and we've had very few residents pass. And I've also had only two real outbreaks. One of them was back around Thanksgiving two years ago initially. And then I had a small outbreak between Christmas and New Year's that we were able to manage working with public health, working with the Nebraska ICAP team and my staff, most importantly, the staff. And the families being understanding and making sure that we've got all of the tools available to us to try and mitigate and contain as much as we can. Residents are wanting to leave. They want to go out and do stuff with their families. And we have to do risk assessments for those things. And we educate the families. Like going to a restaurant when our positivity is in the 20% range is probably not a good idea, but maybe if you could have Grubhub or one of those other food delivery services, or better yet, just run to the restaurant and go pick up the meal and bring it home. And then yes, you can have a family meal at your house if that's something that is safe for the resident to do. Or 
I have family members come in out of town and I joke with them. I'm like, well, you know, you really can't take them to a restaurant, but maybe you can get your hotel to deliver room service or you can run out and grab something someplace. That's how we've been able to allow residents to be able to leave. And we call them outings. Go on a short outing and have it risk assessed. And if need be, and when they return, if we have to quarantine them, they know in advance that that's going to happen. And they understand the why. Not only them, the resident, but also their family. I have a resident who needs to fly to New York for a bat mitzvah. And it's her last grandchild. Okay, fine. You go, please know the family understands totally. Everybody is vaccinated. Everybody's been boosted. So they all meet the definition of the CDC up to date. But still upon her return, we're going to quarantine her for seven days and test her and isolate her from the rest of the population, especially of her unit, until we're certain she didn't accidentally bring something back. Yeah, because our outbreak over Christmas was a resident went on an outing and came back with something. You want to try and mitigate that, but you want to be able to give them those freedoms back. And that's really what they want. It's an extra hurdle. People can't just come breezing in all the time. We need to screen them because that's a requirement. We offer testing to try and help safeguard and make sure that these people understand that they're not bringing something in. And a lot of that is peace of mind for them. And then go from there. Yeah. We want yeah. to try and make this as back to normal as we can. It's not probably ever going to get to that point. We're probably always going to have mass until we don't have it as a threat anymore. Yeah. It really is our new normal, isn't it? And I really love this idea of being able to restore the idea of outings and trying to find ways, strategies to make that not feel like your punishing somebody for going on an outing by having to put them in quarantine when they come back. And yet, I think understanding that there are some risks that patients, residents, and families do feel like are worth taking, for instance, for these big life events and celebrations that really enrich people's lives. So I heard window visits, which, you know, I know that uh, have been implemented a lot of facilities so that family members and residents can be across a, a window and perhaps speaking by phone or with an intercom system. I know that y'all were able to implement some tech that helped with visitation in that remote manner. I know that places have been trying to implement, for instance, daily scheduled calls for the family members for whom that works best. What are some of the other things that you think are strategies that will help carry facilities and, and help really keep whatever our new normal is, make this as normal and, and enriching for your residents as possible? Well, CMS came out with a program called Compassionate Care, and it was designed to try and allow family members to be able to come in and be with their loved ones for the psychosocial benefit. The problem I saw with it was they were gowning and gloving and masking and face shielding and the resident had to try and keep a mask on. And I don't think it really went the way CMS was envisioning mm -hmm. when they came up with it. I know some facilities were able to use it to great success. And then I know others like ours where it really kind of flopped. And I think what it boils down to is your resident population. Who's going to be able to tolerate that type of an event or visit as opposed to somebody else? In November, CMS kind of said, you know what, with vaccines, we slammed the door shut in March, but November of last year, they said, we're going to kind of open things back up. If you're vaccinated, if your staff's vaccinated, we're going to keep the masks on. And they came out with what they called their COVID infection control rules which really means you're screening them, you're using hand hygiene, you are masking, you're encouraging vaccination. Like one of the things CMS says now is when you ask the vaccination questions, if they say no, you have to provide education. So I have an electronic kiosk that my visitors sign in. If they say no, it pops up with the latest from the CDC with the web link that they can click on or snap a photo of and look at. And so that's me trying to provide education. 
Mm-hmm. When people walk in, our staff will ask them, hey, would you be interested in a test today? Or can we get you tested? Or I get accused of almost everybody wants me to test them or will let me test them because I phrase it in such a way that they feel obligated to be tested. <laughs> but we're not advertising the fact that testing is optional. Right. You don't have to be tested. You don't have to have your vaccine. We want you to because it's going to help protect us, protect the loved ones you're there to see. Not to mention it helps protect the staff, which is one of the reasons why our staff is 100% vaccinated and not quite all boosted, but I'll take the 100% vaccination to keep the auditors off my back. I think, as you said, I mean, this is what's safest for your residents, right? It's trying to reduce the risk where you can. And it sounds like screening, masking, and of course, hand hygiene aren't going away. There are things that every facility is going to find ways to do in in the most efficient manner possible so that it doesn't take too much time and energy away from the other work that needs to be done. And I would hope that those kinds of measures might help reduce the seasonal influenza. You know, the other things that we know can be high risk for this population of residents. Well, and the funny thing is that I've had family members say, Well, but masking doesn't help. And I'm like, but it did. The last two years, we've been preaching hand hygiene and masking. And guess what? We've had almost next to nothing in flu. In fact, flu, we had a huge spike of flu last July. And that threw everybody in public health for a tizzy because they're like, well, wait a minute. Why is that happening? I had a CNA who called and said, you know, I have this 102.5 temp and I have the chills and I have a cough and I'm like, okay, well, what are you going to do? She goes, I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to go get tested. I think I have COVID. I said, okay, well, that's fine. I appreciate it. Please let me know. When she called me back, she goes, yeah, I don't have COVID. I have influenza B. And it was like the 15th of July. Yeah. And then she goes on to tell me that half the people in the ER, according to the doc she saw, had influenza B. Yeah. So back in July, everybody was like, well, we've been vaccinated. The CDC says we can get rid of our masks and everybody dropped their guard and poof, guess what happens? Uh, yes. In fact, I think flu numbers right now across the country uh, are, are on the upswing, which is unusual for this time of year. You're right. And influenza by itself has been a real risk for uh, residents and long-term care facilities uh, really for, for a very long time. Yep. So it sounds like We went from this time when we were in total lockdown and y'all were really working to make any plan work to keep residents in touch with families and friends and maintain those social networks. And now we've sort of come to a point where we're going to have to live with some of these things in place. But we're going to try to keep those networks as functional and satisfying as we can. And I just wonder what you see into the future, hoping, of course, that COVID will begin to be maybe something we think about more like the flu. Are there ways we can help with socialization and help reinforce those social networks in ways that don't threaten the safety of residents? Like, Are there ways that we can build technology in and whether it's with better cameras or better tech or easier to use tech? You know, I I really do think about some of the places that just are not going to be able to have like a high speed Internet and wondering what else people can do. Yeah, tech, I think, is a good stopgap measure. If you have an outbreak, you really should not be letting family members come in. Or if the family member is tested positive, but really does need to be able to put eyes on their loved one and be able to talk with their loved one, tech is a good stopgap for that. I didn't lose that many residents to COVID, and I've been very fortunate with that. However, I think we've lost a number of residents to the side effect of no visitation that Mm. psychosocial disconnect that families were able to come in when the residents were actively dying, irregardless of whatever was going on, that was something we didn't prevent. But at the same token, if the resident has that psychosocial feeling of abandonment, a lot of them shut down. 
And wow. that is one of those unspoken about side effects of COVID, the restrictions and everything else. Now, do I think that we should have stayed open and everything else? No. I think what we've done across the board to safeguard our elderly and try and keep them out of the hospitals and those types of things, I think we've done a relatively decent job of that. It's not perfect, but you know what? Nothing is. Medicine as a whole is an art form, and it's one of those art forms that sometimes you learn by mistakes. The boomerang of we're slamming our doors and then reopening everything wasn't the right move to do either, but we all have to juggle it to the best of our abilities and try and stay within those guidelines yeah. and try and That's safeguard everybody. But in the future, I would love to be able to see more interaction between families and the residents, their loved ones. I would love to be able to see them being able to leave and go to events like graduations and weddings and bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs and confirmations or whatever. And yeah. those milestones of life, it, it's kind of like newborn babies. CDC says you can't have a mask on somebody under the age of two. CMS says you can't be in a facility without a mask. Well, how do I get these residents to be able to hold their newest, greatest grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-grandchild? You don't want to prevent that. Right, right. So sure. we have to try and find ways around it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, Jerry, I mean, I think that that's such a great point and, and I'm grateful that you made it. I think that, you know, the other thing that I wonder if we could implement as a tool would also be being able to identify those residents who might be suffering in particular. So what does depression look like? What does withdrawal look like in residents so that we could perhaps take action, as you said, before somebody gets to the point where they're in hospice care, before somebody gets to the point when it's considered end of life, how do we keep these residents engaged and mentally stimulated and perhaps uh, pretty overworked employees able to recognize early signs that somebody's not thriving? I think a lot of it deals with training. Part of the MDS, the minimum data set, Part of that assessment is a depression assessment. But the other part of it is training the activity staff, training the CNAs that are the most interactive with these residents to make sure that they are able to identify when a resident is not quite themselves, not quite as chipper, or they want to sleep more or whatever and allow nursing to be able to get in, do a real formal assessment, try and figure out what's going on and see what we need to do. Now, I've been blessed at my facility that I have an activity department that has more than one person. Those five people have worked their duffs off this entire time, trying to keep people engaged, trying to keep them going, trying to keep them entertained. And I hate to use that word because that's not entirely right, but at least engaged. We have art projects, we have game stuff, our resident council still kind of meets and having them be able to interact with the residents. And again, because I have a big enough activity department, they're able to do those one-to-one -one things that sometimes these residents need. Yeah, I think that has been very helpful, very beneficial. However, Again, like I said, I've been blessed with that. Yeah. And yeah. when you start looking at some smaller facilities or even bigger facilities, they may not have the ability and the funding to be able to do that with their residents. And I think that is kind of a detriment. And I think that's where we've been a little lucky trying to catch them. But again, it doesn't always work. Sure. Yeah, I think that that's a really important point for us to make today, you know, as we start to wrap up this conversation about visitation and long-term care. There may be competing interests, right? There's physical safety, making sure that the facility and the activities are not dangerous for residents. And that could be dangerous 
in all sorts of ways. And one of those ways would be bringing in infections to these people that are most at risk. But it's weighing that against the other things that are dangerous for these residents. And that's this loss of connection, this loss of engagement, the idea of depression really, really shortening someone's life at a point when we want them to be enjoying the fruits of their lifetime. And I think the idea of having your staff and the staff at long-term care facilities really cued in to what those early signs of depression might be. As you said, when somebody's maybe just not quite as you know sharp or engaged or snappy and snazzy as they normally are, recognizing that and being able to intervene early. Because it sounds like these strategies for avoiding infection are not going away. We are going to be waxing and waning with masks and screening and visitation restrictions really as far into the future as I can see. I agree with you on that. I have a lot of family members that go, well, this is the only place I got to wear a mask. And I tell them, I'm sorry, please get used to it. This is not going to change. Yeah. I've had employees go, why do we need to take temps? Almost everybody who was tested positive has never had a temp at least initially. And I'm like, yeah, but until CDC changes their screening guidelines and CMS concurs with it, it's not going to go away. Right. I think we're going to eventually end up in a new normal. I don't know how much of the new normal is going to be what we have now, or if it's going to be a little different or a little more strict. But I think as long as we can go with the flow and the science is able to give us better answers, I think we're kind of stuck with where we're at. And I hope that where we're at in long-term care facilities is really sort of in an alliance, if not a partnership, between our facilities, our families, our residents, and the public health interest, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. a regulatory or a non-regulatory, that sort of interest to make sure that, that we're keeping things safe. I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate you being here, Jerry. And I just think that there's so much important work being done and people working very hard to minimize the impact COVID and these restrictions have had on residents and families. And, and we certainly appreciate all the work that you've been doing. Thank you to Jerry and to those listening at home. Thank you for tuning into this episode on visitation in long-term care settings. We hope you'll join us for future episodes on a wide range of topics from healthcare worker safety, long-term care, personal protective equipment, and more about infectious diseases of all kinds. If you have any questions for us or ideas for future shows, please feel free to contact us at info at .org. Or you can find us on the web at netech.org backslash podcast, where you can subscribe to future episodes and find more information on today's topic. We'll see you next time on Transmission Interrupted. You've been listening to Transmission Interrupted, the podcast series from NeTech, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Learn more at netech.org.